Welcome to another episode of The Inquisitive Analyst. I'm your host, Marcus Udekang. It's the show where we chat about business analysis and project management issues and the challenges and triumphs within those fields. It's inspiring, it's informative, and very much inquisitive. My guest today is a thought leader at the intersection of Agile and business analysis. For over 20 years, he's been helping large organizations adapt and optimize their business analysis and planning practices for Agile software development approaches. He has authored three books based on these experiences, which have become solid references for practitioners. His most recent book is The Agile Guide to Business Analysis and Planning. He also has UML for the IT Business Analyst and the Business Analyst's Handbook, of which I must confess I do have a copy of. He's also a widely requested speaker at international BA and Agile events, which include the European BA Day out of Frankfurt, the BBC Conference, Norway Developers Conference, and the BA Forum out of Poland. And I must confess, he's also a professional artist whose works have been shown extensively in commercial and public galleries. Please help me welcome to today's show, joining us from Toronto, Canada, Howard Podeswa. Welcome, Howard. Hi, Marcus. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Well, it's very much a pleasure to have you on the show. Now, I guess I could start off with a few introductory questions. The first being, how did you get started in business analysis and Agile? Um, I guess by accident, like pretty well everything else in my career. <laughs> I trained actually as a chemical engineer and I was supposed to be working in nuclear power plants. Um, uh, so my whole first part of my life was actually working on software uh, as a developer. Uh, but somewhere around the late uh, 90s, I was looking for a change, a little bit tired of you know writing code day after day. And I mean, it got exciting and doing a lot of design stuff also. Um, uh, but an opportunity came up to uh, do a gig, which was to develop uh, this program for this new profession. It's the 90s, so really, really early, uh, called Business Analysis. Uh, the original client was, I think my first client for this was for Bell, uh, Bell slash CGI. Uh, and they were working with the Rational Unified process. So they were really, really ahead of the game in terms of using an iterative incremental approach to uh, to development, which later became developed into what we now know as Agile. So I guess right from the beginning, I was doing business analysis with Agile, kind of sort of combined. Um, so that's how I got in. Um, uh, this was all really before business analysis was a thing, before there was a Babock. Um, uh, that work led me to do similar work with the CIBC and with Bank of Nova Scotia. And these were all like uh, organizations or at least teams within the organizations, like a divisions that were doing this weird iterative incremental development that uh, the developers were beginning to understand, but nobody knew from these clients how to figure, could figure out how the business analysis piece worked in mm -hmm. that kind of environment. Right. And even the IBM people who developed the process were not really good at explaining that part of it. And so that's kind of became my niche. And mm -hmm. um, I've been doing it ever since. Uh, the It kicked into a higher gear on the agile side around like an actually data to 2013. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that is when a VP at TELUS uh, had a meeting with me and I've already been doing BA work with him. And he said, uh, we're going to move to Agile and the whole, everybody's, the whole organization is moving over. Well, what the hell am I supposed to do with my BAs? <laughs> and uh, that led to a long conversation and it led to a long engagement with TELUS to actually transition their business analysts right across the country oh, okay. um, over to Agile methodologies. And it's, Kind of it led to me working with lots of companies and in, internationally, um, the FDA in the states. Uh, just, it goes on Rogers who were here, uh, Statoil uh, back in the early days has similar kind of requests for me, and uh, ultimately led to the book that I've just put out now, which is about those experiences. So you've become a bit of a who's who in the agile world, no doubt. Uh, I don't know. I'm just doing my work. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I guess the is I, I had the crazy idea a few times to write a book about it. So, uh. well, that's good. That's awesome, man. I, one of your books, like I was mentioning to you earlier, I, I, uh, the Business Analyst Handbook I use, it's like my Bible. So, uh, for business analysis, so fantastic. Yeah, great, splendid work. Thank you so much. So, if I if I were to look at some business analyst questions, like mm -hmm. for example, when and why should business analysts use activity diagrams? Mm -hmm. 
what would my answer be? Yeah, what would you? <laughs> <laughs> well, my answer, first of all, would be: I think it's a great idea to do workflow diagrams, but it doesn't necessarily have to be an activity diagram. Okay. An activity diagram just happens to be the UML uh, standards version of what we would normally think of as a swim lane workflow diagram in business analysis. Uh, if you are going to use a standard, actually today, I would change that advice and say BPMN, business mm -hmm. process modeling notation, would probably be the ideal one to go. But in any case, the standard is not that important. It's the fact of doing the modeling that's important. Um, in terms of when you should do it, the scenarios for doing it um, would be anytime you need to look at an entire process, you know, from start to finish. Or, uh, and where the workflow is important. So that happens if you're creating a new process, like it's, it's a new service or a new product that has new, new processes around it. Um, when you're merge, merging processes, an like example there would be, uh, I worked with BMO at around the time that they uh, took over Harris Bank. And so they had an issue of merging the systems, systems that they had that were duplicated between one bank and another. Uh, to do that kind of work, the first step is to analyze both systems, the workflow of both processes, and then see where the gaps are. So that's the type of thing that, you know, we'd want to do that as well. Uh, even if you're buying uh, an off-the-shelf solution, you want to look at the gaps between that solution and what you have. And a workflow model gives you, you know, a common, a common um, picture to look at. Uh, and I'd say today in Agile, you know, uh, it's, does that, that necessity doesn't end. The context and the language around it might change. So we'll, we might call it part of feature preparation or part of the preparation that you do before a release. Um, but, you know, we still do it. We still do it before any major change. Fantastic. And then yes. the benefits, uh, I guess one last thing, even more, most important uh, in terms of agile, because the teams are small, you have an extra, extra issue that you don't have when you have very large teams in waterfall. Mm -hmm. And that is how do you coordinate all these teams, mm -hmm. all these tiny little small teams and, um, each team might be working on a step in the workflow. And so it's very important before any of those teams starts to work on that process that all of them have the same understanding of what that process is. And they can do so, so with, with the, the, the need yeah. doesn't go away because of mm -hmm. Agile. In fact, it's even more important. Mm, actually, that's good to know. Yeah, because of Agile, it's even more important. Now, why, why should a class diagram, and I haven't used class diagrams in a while, but I did study them mm -hmm. eons ago. Why, why should a class diagram really matter to a business analyst? I mean, in, in what type of business context can class diagrams be used? Okay. Well, I like the word should <laughs> because it's the difference between the should and the practice. I have to be honest with you. Yeah. Uh, when I wrote the UML book, I, I, there's a lot of pages on class diagrams in there because I really mm -hmm. did feel like they're an extremely important point, part mm -hmm. of business analysis. The reason for doing them is uh, twofold, with, with, that actually it's many fold. Um, uh, one of them is it, it reveals a lot of requirements and rules that would otherwise can mm. either pass you by. And often these are numerical relationships between, let's say, you know, how many organizations can an employee belong to, uh, how many contact numbers are associated mm. with an account or with a credit card, all those kind of fine things. Uh, they, help, uh, under, they help the developers understand business language. Mm. Um, I work with a the telecom group that were talking about these product groups and they kept talking about this and it turned out that it was only once I did the class model that mm -hmm. I understood what the relationship was between a product group and a person's telephone line and so on and so on and the services that are on that line and so I find it really really incredible for straightening those kind of issues out. Um, I thought they should be important to shift that diagram left that kind of modeling activity not wait until design when I used to do it when I was a developer, mm -hmm. but actually do it at the business analysis side because often I found that as a developer that by the time I got to doing that, there were a lot of unanswered questions. Mm -hmm. But I was wondering why had not why had the BA not asked that question up front? Well, they weren't doing the modeling. Now, mm -hmm. the reality is that today, it's not a widely used technique by business analysts. It's still considered to be a technical technique, but it should not be. It should not, and, there is a little bit of a return to it as an analysis technique because of um, the resurgence of uh, an approach called design uh, DDD, okay, um, yeah, yeah. domain-driven design. Uh, and, you know, you, you end up doing informal diagrams, but you do them. So I think they have great value, but I will admit to you, they're not as widely used as I would like to see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's probably one reason why I've not used them as much as yes, I should. Yeah, you're, yeah. you're not the only person. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about requirements maturity. Why is requirements maturity of an organization more important than 
the development method that is used. Mm. All right, so um, the results here or that sort of conclusion um, comes out of um, a very extensive study that was done, that's quoted in the book, uh, originally done by IAG. <clears throat> and um, uh, that's the finding that it found when you, when you go through the numbers. Uh, there's no, I couldn't find an explanation in that study, so I can't say for sure, but I have my gut feelings about it. Sort of, uh, so here's, take it for, you know, take it as you will. Um, when I dug into the study itself, that study applies to large projects. So that's, that's okay. the only kind of projects they were looking at. Okay. And I think that uh, it's definitely been my observation that the larger the initiative that is being carried mm -hmm. out, the more important it is for business analysis to be done right mm -hmm. and requirements management to be done right. If you're working on a very, on, on a, uh, a simple product that's not um, technically complex and also not conceptually complex as a product, uh, and there aren't many teams working on it. And for the most part, what they're doing are small stories that give, you know, incremental functionality. Right. Uh, you can get away without a very mature requirements process. You talk to the, you talk to the client and you do a little bit of work. Uh, but when you're talking about a very complex system where there are many interconnected parts and a lot of teams that have to be coordinated and all aligned on the same rules, uh, there's no way to do that without a mature requirements analysis process. And because that's the kind of projects that we were talking about, that's why it's important. Mm -hmm. I don't think, by the way, it's a small, uh, uh, it's a negative against the report that only looked at big projects. You don't usually find BAs in small organizations to start off with, so it wouldn't even come up. It's generally, in these, <clears throat> sorry, large organizations that, you know, that kind of, that you'll find business analysts and then the potential conflict between, or, coordination between BAs and Agilists you know, yeah. comes to the floor. Yeah. The new battle has begun. Now, the Business Analyst Handbook. I have a copy of it, like I mentioned previously. Yeah. I use it extensively. I recommend it to other people. What's the book's main focus? Well, when I wrote the book, I was actually thinking of an art book that I was very fond of <clears throat> as, during my training as an artist. And it was a book by Ralph Meyer, I think it was called the uh, the artist's handbook of materials and techniques mm. and basically if there was any problem you needed to solve you would just you know it's like an encyclopedia you know open up to that point oh i got a gesso yeah. canvas and here is the instructions for properly gessoing and preparing a canvas so it can be you know you can paint mm. on it and so i wanted to do something like that for ba so i wanted a ba to have a reference manual that they could just open up and oh i've got a diagram i'm not sure how to interpret it there it is i don't even know when to use it there is some instruction. Uh, I'm walking into a meeting. What kind of questions should I be asking right now? And where do I put the answers? Basically, it's a cheat sheet. And I developed it that way. It's sort of a cheat sheet for teams that I was working with. And I just kept collecting questions that they would ask me, uh, templates that they needed and so on, and just kept adding to the cheat sheet until it eventually became big enough that I thought, I, I guess I should print this out as a job, as job aids for the practitioner. What that book is not, though, it is not a teaching guide. So by no means is that meant to be something that you start at the beginning and read your way through in order to learn the profession. Uh, that would be like reading an encyclopedia. No, it's, mm. a, it's a reference guide. And that's right. why I had, it works together with the other book that I put out around the same time, mm. UML for the IT Business Analyst, which actually walks you through the job from the beginning uh, of initiative through to the end. Fantastic. Yeah, I, I use Business Analyst Handbook definitely as a reference. Like you said, it really meticulously spells out those questions you need to ask during a meeting, like the you know, the diagrams you need to use and so on. And I thought, my heavens, this really cuts. It's a shortcut. It, it just, it gets me right to the point and I can just move on and it's just fantastic. So thank you for writing it. No, well, thanks for that feedback. That's exactly what I was, what I was looking for with that. Yeah, book. I think it's, it's, uh, it's helped a lot of BAs. Now you mentioned UML for IT business analyst and yeah. uh, it explores the BA function with within like an iterative incremental process. Like you said, if you want to you really go deep into stuff, that's what it explains. Maybe you can elaborate a bit more on that book. Yeah, so that book came out of the work that I did with those initially with the banks. Uh, I mentioned to you the CIBC, Bank of Nova Scotia, and then later Rogers and all, all the other companies that, that started to follow on from that. And basically they were, um, they'd purchased this rep, this inc incremental process, they'd committed to it. Um, all, all this stuff comes with a tool. So, you know, the vendor would give them a lot of guidance on how to use the tool, but not guidance on what the actual 
and our requirements analysis process look like mm -hmm. and how it would fit into all of this. So out of frustration, actually, these clients started calling me in because, you know, the, the IBM, the vendor is not able to help us on this part of it. And then our BAs are just kind of at a loss, much as many BAs are at a loss today also, you know, as things have matured in Agile. So it's been like this kind of from the beginning. And, and uh, so I started working with them on that. And so the book is really about how to do business analysis in an iterative incremental manner. And it just so happens to use the UML as the standard. Uh, but I don't really mean it to be, you know, a UML book right. per se. It's really a book about the requirements analysis process done iteratively using that as your standard. Okay. All right. um, so it's very use case driven uh, because use, uh, use case is all about usages. You know, what, what is it that the user wants to do with the system? And that the idea is that all the requirements should be organized around usage and your implementation plan should be also organized around usage so that, you get, you sort of uh, are delivering little mini usages along the way. The fancy word for that today is use case slices in the use case world or user stories in the agile world. Um, so that was the that was the idea behind it. Fantastic, fabulous. You got this new book out, The Business Case for Agile Business Analysis. You talk about a tale that's, of two- That's an article, yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Oh, actually, sorry, sorry, that was an article. Yeah, let's, let's talk about the article for a bit. Yeah, The Business Case for Agile Business Analysis. Let's talk about the article yeah. a bit. So you talk, you talk a bit about the tale of two, of two solitudes between the BA and the Agile, and actually that parallels just what you're talking about, the, the BA being kind of confused in the Agile world. So, so why are these considered two solitudes, the BA and the Agile? Oh, there's a lot, a lot behind that question. I guess one is, I happen to have here, a very well-thumbed, have you ever seen that book? Uh, no, I haven't actually, no. It's the, I, 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 see, I think I've seen software. pictures of it. It's a beautiful book. I love the, I love the cover. Agile Software Development with Scrum. Uh, this is the book that kind of introduced the world to Scrum and the most popular Agile methodology when things came out, first came out at least. Uh, it's still probably so today. There is not one word in that book about business analysis. I don't think the word requirement shows up there even once. Um, there are product backlog items, which I can tell you are the requirements but <laughs> they call them PBIs. There is nothing in there about how to get these PBIs into your backlog. Uh, what was the work that was done? What kind of elicitation was done? It's just all just there. And then the process runs from that point. Okay. So I think that first of all, just f f not mentioning analysis at all was <laughs> one reason that many people still today think there is no place for a business analyst on a scrum team mm -hmm. because they're, yeah. they're never mentioned. By the way, I think that's a total misunderstanding because nobody's mentioned on a scrum team. It's by design. Mm -hmm. We don't mention testers either, but it doesn't mean that there aren't going to be right. testers on the team. It's a, it's more a naming convention, not to name people by their job. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's one of it. The other thing has to do with historically, the historic vision of BAs and how they develop versus mm -hmm. the Agile Manifesto. So BAs were very, very associated with waterfall projects. And mm -hmm. the job of a BA was highly associated in people's minds with somebody who writes an enormous tome, the business mm -hmm. requirements document, uh, HLRD and then, then SRS and you know, various levels of this documentation. It's all done in meticulous detail before anybody writes a line of code. <laughs> and basically once this is done, it's sealed, frozen, yeah. and very hard to make changes to that document. You throw it over the fence and the developers do the rest. That's totally antithetical to what the Agile Manifesto is all about, which is tries to write in the manifesto, talks about minimizing the amount of documentation that's created, um, minimizing the roadblocks between the business side and the developers in favor of direct communication between the two. So this idea of a BA as a go-between doesn't make sense anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, so there seemed to be in that kind of a world, no place for the kind of work that BAs were actually doing. And so for this kind of the combined reason of those two things, the two start to split. Mm -hmm. And so you saw agile teams happening with no business analysts in them at all. Uh, business analysts working on waterfall and in the places where they were trying to combine the two, and this was typically mainstream large organizations that already had BAs, they were now kind of in a quandary with mm. what I mentioned about this Telos VP, what am I supposed to do with my BAs now? Do they fit in this organization or not? So that's the history. Mm. Okay, All right. As I see it anyway, as to why things were 
we're the way they are. Okay, great, fantastic. Now, uh, getting back to actually what I was also going to ask you, uh, the book, the, your, your latest and greatest book, The Agile Guide to Business Analysis and Planning from Strategic Plan to Continuous Value Delivery. Let's uh, talk a bit about that. Can you explain what, uh, what the, the central focus of that book is? Yes. So, um, th- I mean, the, that book really started from that meeting in 2013 with uh, TELUS and then later in Statoil the same year. And that same year was also when I went to that NDC conference and spoke about agile analysis and found out that I was the only person in this conference of chat. I don't know, they had like a hundred speakers or a large number of speakers. Not, nobody else was talking about it. So uh, the book is basically uh, trying to answer all of the questions that organizations who have been going through an agile transformation uh, and trying to tackle that with where to fit the business analysis function in there, trying to answer all the questions that have been asked about me, asked to me over these years working with these with these companies. Um, and so it's based the, the the point of the of the book is basically to take all the agile practices, these family of practices that that have shown to have great value, but each of which applies to a different part of the life cycle, and show how they all actually string together. How do you actually take a product, say you're a product owner, and you want to take it from its initial vision all the way down to the detailed requirements and acceptance criteria, you know, for that product, and then a detailed plan for how to make, how to actually implement those requirements over, over long periods. Uh, how do you do that? And how do you do that in a way that's agile, that allows for change along the way, when you don't know a lot beforehand of what the requirements are, because the product might be so novel, it's not even possible to know what all those things are. How do you manage all of that? That's what this book is, basically a, a roadmap for doing that. And it walks the reader through from the beginning all the way through. But as to what you would gain from it, it actually depends on um, uh, who you are as a reader. So the primary readers for me on this would be our practitioners, people actually working at it day to day uh, or who are about to do that. So either you're uh, a product owner uh, or a proxy product owner. Uh, working on an agile team or in charge of a bunch of teams, uh, or you're a BA. So for that type of a reader, on the PO side, you'll learn how to organize and coordinate your teams, uh, how to analyze the market using agile techniques, um, how to create a a vision statement, whether it's for the product as a whole or for a major change, like an epic in agile terms, Uh, how to plan uh, how those requirements will be analyzed and implemented, at various planning horizons, up all the way up from the short term to very long term plans of a few years, um, how to do planning in a in a state of uncertainty, uh, where you have to actually plan do a very very different type of plan than a traditional plan. The plan is basically a plan to figure out what the requirements are and to continually figure it out. So it involves uh, creating MVPs, identifying hypotheses behind the process, and testing those hypotheses. Um, so, you know, it's, it's about all of that from the PO point of view, from the BA point of view, it's about how to take the PO's vision and communicate that down to the team and to bring it all the way down to small requirements units, which typically we refer to as user stories and the acceptance criteria for those user stories, how to maintain the backlog over time, um, you know, how to, uh, prepare stories and features, all of that kind of work. And then I'd say that maybe the third reader would be somebody who's a BA lead or a, a, a leader of a center of excellence. Uh, and at the higher level, you'll learn how to tweak the analysis process for your organization because it always needs to be tuned, mm-hmm. uh, how to set up the backlog in the first place, uh, how to set up process parameters like the uh, work in progress limits, WIP limits mm-hmm. from Kanban or uh, definition of ready, uh, how to build a library of resources for your team know, all that kind of high level stuff. So really three types of readers there. It's comprehensive and I'd highly recommend it to just about any BA out there. How can someone get a copy of this book? Amazon.ca, amazon.com? Yes. So um, yeah, it's available on Amazon. Most people will go there. Uh, So if you're in Canada, amazon.ca, amazon.com otherwise, or whatever your country is, Uh, it's available in hard copy and ebook. The publishers also um, uh, is is it, the publishers inform it i n f o r m i t 
Uh, if you go there, uh, you can get various discounts as well. Mm. Uh, but the only thing with that is that um, they're US based. Mm. So these discounts are helpful uh, for um, those who live in the States. But if you don't, they would have to then send you the book and, mm. you know, the, the, that's not the way to go. No. Uh, but I'll, I'll uh, share with you afterwards, if I haven't done so already, a discount that uh, for people in the States, it'll be definitely useful for them. Um, they'll get a, a large discount on the book if they go to the publisher. Fantastic. Yeah, we can leave them that link as well underneath the YouTube um, uh, video. Now, what fascinates me about you, Howard, is and I rarely have ever seen this. In fact, I've never seen this before. A business analyst who's also an artist, a professional artist. Now, mm -hmm. as, a, as a professional artist, you know, your, your works have been shown in commercial and public galleries. Maybe you can give us a brief summary of how you got into the art business. That's, <laughs> that would fascinate me. And what galleries can we go to see your work in? All right. So I got into the art business uh, in the uh, 80s. Uh, I already, I, I did the opposite of what most people do. They become an artist first, and then they go, then they go now I'm going to yeah. get a real job. Right. I got the real job first. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, oh, you know what? I really got to be an artist. Um, my dad was an artist, and I sort of, like it was hard to escape it. My uncle was an artist. My grandfather was an artist. Oh. They're all painters. And uh, my brother is not a painter, but he paints with images. He's a film director. So this is kind of in the blood. And um, I made the mistake, I think, in my last year of university of walking into an art class and it kind of rekindled the family gene. And it, it became an obsession. And eventually I went to art school and I, I did the full program uh, you know, graduated from art school and uh, have been leading a, a double life ever since. Even through art school, I actually worked on uh, the, uh, <clears throat> I don't know if you remember this from your days in Toronto, but the Go Transit uh, station. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. Uh, I worked on the system that handles the scheduling at oh. Union Station, and that paid my way through Ontario College of Art. <laughs> I was, I was going to ask if you went to OCAD. You went to, yeah, I Ontario did, College. Yeah, okay, yeah. nice. Now, wow. You, it was OCA back then. They, they okay, had all right. Yeah, uh, they, 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 I was going to say, they, they built this mammoth uh, building, yeah. which is just, uh, anyway, it's an eyesore. Anyway, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, that's the whole other story. Um, so, yeah, to see my work, um, I, the, uh, my work's been shown at the Koffler Gallery. So if you visit K-O-F-F-L-E-R and maybe do a search on Koffler Pedeswa, okay. uh, if you go to my website, howardpedeswa.com, it's just my name.com, uh, you'll find links to all of that stuff there. Uh, my last commercial shows were in the uh, Birch Gallery uh, in Toronto. Uh, so if you visit their site, you'll be able to, to see that. Uh, actually, down closer to your end, I had a show at the Kelowna Art Gallery. Nice. Um, they actually, it was ma amazing. They, they took 15-foot works and, you know, we, they traveled across the country to Kelowna from here and back. So that was, that was a bit of a logistics uh, nightmare, but fun. Um, yeah, so those are places where you can find out about that. Uh, you're a well-accomplished person. I don't know anyone who's, I know people who dabbled in art, but to go to the extent of actually put them in galleries and written books on business analysis just overwhelms me. Fascinating. You know, you just see something, you go, oh, I should do this, and then you do it. And then, yeah. you know, before you know it, you've got this crazy life. So oh, That's fantastic. And if, if anyone from the audience wants to get in touch with you, Howard, how can they do so? Uh, the best way would be to contact me through email, I guess. Uh, and it's uh, uh, Howard Pedeswa at noblelink.ca, N O B L E I N C.ca. Actually, you can find me on LinkedIn if, you, if people can't remember okay. that. There is no other okay. Howard Pedeswa on LinkedIn. It's too weird a name. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thanks, Howard. This has been been very informative, very inquisitive, very and and I just a storehouse of knowledge. I guess I look at your books. Like I, I, I got to get that agile book. I don't have it yet. The most recent one, but uh, you know, like I said, the, the handbook for business analysts, it's just, it's like my Bible. So <laughs> thanks for being on the show. So great it's been fantastic. Here. Yeah. Thank yeah. you very much. I hope you enjoy the next one. The one come, the one that's uh, just came out from your description. I'm going to go buy it as soon as we get off this call. <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> definitely. Well, thanks very much, Howard. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Have a great day. You too. Okay, bye.